is it the beer that's giving you a beer belly or is it the actions that the beer is causing you to take that's giving you the beer belly? Let's dive in. Beer does give you a beer belly. There's no denying that. Okay, the estrogenic components, all these different factors, the dense carbohydrates, everything plays a role. Okay, but a beer belly is really just a large amount of visceral fat. And there's other ways that we accumulate that. So how are you getting a beer belly besides just drinking beer? The first one is trans fat consumption. What frustrates me about trans fats is that Everyone out there that is anti-trans fat is talking about atherosclerosis, they're talking about this, they're talking about clogging your arteries, but they're actually not connecting with people on what is going to get their attention first and foremost. Look, you can tell someone that it's going to affect their health and it will kind of make them conscious of it, but if you tell them how much it's going to affect their waistline and their belly, they're probably going to listen a little bit more. There was a study published in the journal Obesity that took a look at uh, these monkeys, these male monkeys that they followed around for five years, okay? And what they did is they had them consume either uh, trans fats or healthier forms of fats. Well, same amount of calories, okay? But the group that was consuming the trans fats had a 7.2% increase in abdominal fat versus a 1.8% increase. Calories were the same. Okay, what's even more wild is 30% of that was visceral fat. What the heck? Trans fats are just fats that our bodies cannot really break down right. Okay, it takes days, weeks to really break them down properly. And because we don't process them, they get stored in different ways. But what they found with this study is it probably had more to do with the uh, insulin receptor activity being decreased. Basically, the body wasn't able to process carbohydrates or anything as well because it decreased the insulin sensitivity. Therefore, the fat accumulated more with those visceral adipocytes, the fat in the visceral region. So, yeah, so what does that mean? That means the peanut butters, that means the fast foods, the things like that. That's the stuff we really have to watch out for because it's not just bad for our health, it actually contributes to a beer belly. Anyhow, the next one, low bacteria diversity. Yes, it's not just about how much you poop. It's really not, okay? The bacteria is a huge, huge component. And there was a landmark study published in the journal Nature that took a look at 123 non-obese people and 169 obese people, and they took a look overall, people with high gene count, which meant high diversity, a lot of diversity of gut bacteria versus low diversity of gut bacteria. They found all kinds of crazy correlations, insane stuff that you wouldn't even believe that low diversity, people that didn't have a lot of gut bacteria were uh, just, all these biomarkers were worse, their weight was worse, and this and that. But when you go back nine years, they look at these participants over nine years before this, and they found that those that had the low diversity, not a lot of gut bacteria, they gained the most weight by a landslide. What does that mean? That means that consuming the fibers, consuming the veggies that I don't know, maybe are good for us, don't just play a role in how we go to the bathroom. They don't just play a role in our overall calorie consumption. They send signals that help our body utilize different fuel sources better so we don't store them as visceral fat. Which leads me to the next one, okay? This has to do with how much fiber you're getting in, but it also has to do, of course, with your bacteria, right? Because it flows hand in hand. Now, people that generally consumed lower amounts of fiber gained a lot more visceral fat. But here's a wild thing, is this study I'm about to reference is going to blow your mind, it blew my mind, okay? I have to set something aside first though. If you're someone that is doing a very, very, very low carb diet or even a carnivore diet, this doesn't apply quite as much, okay? If you're doing zero fiber, you have a whole different system that's coming into play. It's a whole different world, a whole different discussion, which I've talked about before. But if you're not doing carnivore, you're better off making sure you get an abundance of fiber. Here's why. Okay, there was a lifestyle study that took a look at 1,114 participants, okay? They looked at them over the course of five years. Now, they analyzed their lifestyle like crazy. They went deep, okay? They ripped them apart with their diet. They broke down every part of these people's lives, and then they did a CT scan to see what their true visceral fat levels were and where their fat was displaced throughout their body, okay? Well, guess what? At the end of the five-year study, they reverse engineered everything, and they found that those that consumed more soluble fiber had significantly less visceral fat. In fact, they correlated that just a 10 gram increase of soluble fiber, 10 grams consumed each day, 
was related to a 3.7% decrease in their visceral fat after five years. So if you found a way to add 10 grams of soluble fiber, like chia, flax, something simple, psyllium even, well, 10 grams of that per day can equate to 3.7% less visceral fat that is highly bad for you, very, very bad for you, toxic, leaks inflammatory cytokines, anyway, just terrible stuff. Plus it looks freaking ugly, right? Okay, on to the next one, low protein. Okay, yeah, we see that people that do not consume good amounts of protein typically have larger amounts of visceral fat, and it has to do with two things. Okay, one, protein is thermogenic. Every time you consume protein, 20% of those calories are getting used up just to digest and burn the protein. So it's like you're getting 20% free, all right? But here's the wild study I wanna reference. Study published in the journal Obesity took a look at 12 people and had these 12 people swap out 30% of their diet. Okay, they said increase your protein 30%, but keep your calories the same. So swap out some fats, swap out some carbs. We don't care what you swap out. Just make sure you're increasing protein 30% while keeping your calories the same. Well, they found that when they did that, they had between a 10 and a half and a 14.6% increase in their resting energy expenditure. I don't know if that's setting off any crazy flags for you right now, but that means that just by changing the protein consumption, they burned up to 14.6% more calories doing zilch, doing nothing, just being alive, just existing. Their body is burning fat, doing nothing because they added more protein. Okay. Why is there this weird thing out there that's telling everyone not to eat as much protein when it's probably one of the most powerful metabolic drivers we could really play with? Anyhow, the reason behind it is simple, okay? When you have a higher quality mass, muscle mass, the energy that it takes to maintain that muscle mass as far as what is called protein turnover is concerned, directly pulls energy that is derived from fat. The energy or ATP that is required to maintain protein turnover is largely a beta oxidation process. It is largely driven by fat. So literally by having muscle, the mere act of maintaining muscle pulls from your fat stores and it likes to pull from guess what? Your beer belly. Fun, fun, right? There we go. The source of protein, you can get down to the granular on which one works, but literally adding a protein shake throughout your day could be a huge factor in just improving this for you. If you're wondering which one I use, I usually use Sun Warrior, which I put a link down below. Sun Warrior is a pea and hemp protein, so that way you're getting a plant-based protein powder, but the reason that I mention that is because then you're actually getting the fibers that break down too, so it can support the whole gut diversity thing that I've talked about it as well. Anyway, there is a special link so you can save 15% off what is called Warrior Blend. So Warrior Blend is my go-to protein powder when it comes down to a plant-based protein powder. So check them out, Sun Warrior down below, 15% off if you use that link down below. I know you're probably using a protein powder anyway, so you might as well use this one since they support the channel and you get a little bit of a price break. This next one is kind of funny. It's stress, okay? Spoiler alert. But what's weird about stress is that stress itself isn't necessarily causing the beer belly. It's the actions that go along with stress that does. Now, let me explain what that means. So there was one study where they took a look at uh, hair samples of individuals. And when they pulled their hair samples, they're able to sort of chronologically see like when their cortisol levels were high. So they looked at the base of their hair to see like, were they recently stressed out? So they found those that were recently uh, with high levels of cortisol. And they found that, hey, what do you know? They happened to gain weight during that period of time. And then they went back and ones that were less stressed out over a longer period of time and they didn't gain weight during that time. So cortisol, direct correlation there. But if you expand on it and you understand why, it's not just the cortisol. You see, cortisol can increase what is called lipoprotein lipase. Lipoprotein lipase is an enzyme that preps and prepares fat to be stored. If fat cells have not been acted upon or adipocytes have not been acted upon by lipoprotein lipase, they cannot effectively be stored. They don't just magically float around and store. They have to get acted upon by these enzymes. Well, cortisol tends to activate lipoprotein lipase. And cortisol acts via what is called a glucocorticoid receptor. Okay, now glucocorticoid receptors are not just evenly dispersed throughout our body. We have the highest concentration of glucocorticoid receptors in our visceral fat. So what that means is that cortisol affects our visceral region significantly more because we have a high concentration of where cortisol can actually act. So that means that we produce more lipoprotein lipase in our 
visceral region. So when we get stressed out, that effectively puts us in a position to potentially store more of the fat right there in our visceral beer belly region. What's funny is that we have like less glucocorticoid receptors in like our femoral area or our legs and things like that. So it's kind of funny, like, right, when someone's stressed out, they tend to just get that hard distended abdomen. So remember how I said lipoprotein lipase makes fat cells ready to get stored. Well, because we have more of those glucocorticoid receptors in the visceral region and they're ready to store there, well, that's not the end of this story, right? What happens is those fat cells now have to get acted upon by insulin. So I want you to think of it like this. Think of these fat cells that are inside a Trojan horse. And inside this Trojan horse, there's this, uh, these couple of guys in there, they're just amping everybody up. Come on, everyone, we're going to war. We're going to war. Let's get ready to go. That's the lipoprotein lipase, right? It's prepping them for war. It's prepping them for war. But until someone opens the door of that Trojan horse, they can't really do much. So what happens? You're stressed out, you're stressed out, you're stressed out, and then you go and you eat some carbohydrates because that's what sounds good right now because you're stressed out and you want to snack on something. So you just spiked your insulin, you just opened that door. So now all these warriors that are ready to go, they go right into your fat cells and they, or they go right into this whole area, into your visceral region. So that is the lethal combination of stress plus carbs. Stress itself is not good, it has other effects, but directly as far as visceral fat is concerned, it's the stress plus the carbs. And typically, if you start looking at lifestyle factors and you back things up, you're drinking a lot of beer, maybe it's because you're stressed out and you're trying to calm something else down and you're making other lifestyle choices that go along with it. So is the beer causing the beer belly? Yeah, sure, to some degree, the estrogen, but you know, if you live perfectly healthy lifestyles and you have everything to a T and you have a couple of beers, you're probably not having a beer belly, right? But if you are sloppy, stressed, snacking on crud, and you're drinking beer, then yes, it's going to be a catalyst for more of a beer belly. I hope this video explains some things, and as always, keep it locked in, and don't forget to save 15% on Sun Warrior down below. I'll see you tomorrow.